Hello, so this is another Q&A and it's a home education related Q&A. I figured I'd walk and talk today but it's just occurred to me I'm probably going to trip over because I'm staring at the lens. <laughs> and it's a bit cloudy up there. Look at those clouds. I have an umbrella but <laughs> we might end up back in the kitchen. Let's see how it goes. So today's video is a kind of themed one mostly and it's about creating a curriculum for primary school or younger age children and I've had quite a few questions about this so I'll put them on the screen now. So Michael and Jenna Loren ask what type of curriculum and or materials did you use in the younger years? Catherine Bell asks, what curriculum do you recommend for primary school children? Thank you. And here's quite a long one from Lindy Clay. Now, I've met Lindy actually, but this is what she asks. Hey Imo, I'm home edding Lily again and the twins. I still have a lot of your advice from six years ago in my head and are enjoying an organic approach so far. I will need more structure. How do I begin to set up a timetable of what to do? Which resources slash plans did you use when Izzy was eight years old and 11? What would your top book recommendations or lessons be for me to read to help to get a balanced programme? Thank you. And I have put your page on my Facebook page for others to check out. Oh, thanks for that. And there were a couple of extra questions as well, but I'll save them till after because these are all related to primary years. So the first thing I used to do when starting to set up my terms planning for Izzy when she was in her younger years, you might not expect this, but what I did was I was actively opportunistic about events that were happening and opportunities that we had around us in our area and places that were commutable. So I used to get a copy of what in our area in South Wales was called the Primary Times, I expect it still exists, which was a, a, one of these free magazines. And I think most areas probably have them. So it would list things like art and craft sessions at the museum and there were regular slots of these at weekends and in holidays, library art and craft events or storytelling events, events at the castle for instance, or maybe 1940s day where lots of enthusiasts would come with all their 1940s gear and spread them all out in the castle and you could go from stall to stall having some hands-on experience with these things and chatting to the experts in the field, um, that sort of thing. Loads of those happened and I would diarise them. I would pick, cherry pick the ones that I thought Isabel would enjoy and ones that would fit in with like pre-existing classes that we did and I would diarise those. So that was step one. <laughs> and also I would put in her existing groups and classes that she did if she had any and if she didn't I would do a bit of googling and find some based on her current interest like for instance swimming lessons gymnastics so you can look at leisure center pamphlets as well and probably online so those are all going and yeah so that'd be my starting point so I'd fill those in first because those were the immovable ones that I couldn't move around and including that would be our home ed group of course and we would be at our home ed group come hell or high water. It was really important to us to get there every week and hang out with the other home edders, do hands-on craft activities and whatever the activities were on offer according to what parents were offering what skills to share. And another place that I would go to to get hold of these activities to schedule in was Facebook because if you're a home educator already, you probably know that Facebook has a lot of groups for home educators and it also has Facebook groups that are separated by region. And on these groups, there are quite a few proactive members of the community who will organise group days out, for instance, ice skating or meetups in the play parks, in the indoor play centres, indoor climbing on climbing walls, what else, bowling den building we've done sometimes they're one-off events like den building where everybody just gets together and does it one day in the woods somewhere somewhere where we have permission to be or what else techniquest now that's another one our local techniquest well it's not local to me but it's in cardiff they do home educator days so that's another thing that would go in the diary i would look on their website in the educator section and put all those in the diary at the start of term so i knew that they were coming and not to schedule something else at that time. Sometimes there would be some short courses on offer, either free or for a fee, which I'd find out about through our Facebook groups as well. For instance, Isabel 
did a script writing course with a group of home educators of various ages and that was at the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff, that was a notable one. We've done like a week of art workshops with the same group every day. Now I did not use a packaged curriculum for Izzy until she reached key stage four, which is age 14, 16 by the way. Um, until then I would use a structured progressive curriculum for English and maths, but not the other things. And the way I would do it was I would find out which workbooks followed the curriculum to the letter. <laughs> you can look up the curriculum online. You don't have to follow the national curriculum, by the way, if you home educate under the current legislation. This is 2020. So, but I wanted to because I was never sure if Izzy would want to go back to school at any point and I wanted her to be at the same literacy and mathematics level as the others just so that she could slot in more easily. So that's why I particularly chose to do that, but you really don't have to. You can go at the pace of your child. So I would get a main book. I'm trying to think which ones I used. Possibly WH Smith's own textbooks and workbooks. And also I used Collins. I used Let's. I used Scholastic. You know, I've been at this a long time, so <laughs> there's a lot of scope for different syllabuses on different years. But anyway, those were some of the ones I used. And they were kind of my primary ones, my main ones, that I would use to keep us on the straight and narrow. <laughs> but I would supplement these with some other workbooks as well, as well as, of course, videos online, worksheets printed off the internet, maybe. There are some subscription-based things that you can subscribe to, like Twinkle is one, but we never did any of those. You subscribe to them and then you've got unlimited access to print off all the worksheets you could ever desire. <laughs> but we were on a budget, so didn't do that. As I was saying, I would have my primary workbooks that I would follow through, that I knew through research were following the curriculum. But I would also get some like secondary workbooks. I don't mean secondary as in age, I just mean as in the ones I would go to as a plan B <laughs> kind of thing and I would forage them from charity shops, book sales, bargain basements in WH Smith's was a real favourite of mine because you could get them reduced to about 50p. I used to get books from the library sales, they weren't workbooks but they would possibly be supplementary on climbing up a hill. <sighs> but all these workbooks you see they would follow the same curriculum, they're all kind of the same stuff but worded differently and they might have different illustrations, they might be different colours. And so I'd have those in my arsenal, as it were. So we would start our way working through our topic in the main book. And if my child sailed through it, it was easy peasy, already knew it or whatever, uh, we'd move on the next day. But if she struggled with it, I had my secondary ones in reserve. So the next day we'd do one from the next workbook, but the same thing again, but worded differently. And if that still didn't click, next day, <laughs> go to the, another one of the uh, ones in the arsenal which would have a page on that as well, but worded differently or illustrated differently. And eventually she'd usually get it. She never quite knew how long it was going to take until you got into it really. So anyway, once I had got in my diary all the groups, clubs, classes, events, holidays we might be taking, doctor's appointments if they were in advance, you know, that kind of thing. Once those were all done then I would start to fill in in the diary the other things that the daily essentials, literacy and maths for us were daily essentials. When Izzy was very little, I'm trying to remember how much time I spent at age six, I think she was doing possibly 20 minutes a day of literacy and 20 minutes a day of maths and the rest would be other subjects but not quite as intense, you know, at that age. The maths and English tended to be sitting down at a desk writing and listening and reading but the other things were more being read to or having an experience you know or watching something on a video so at six she really didn't do a lot and at that age we had a visit from the LEA which is optional and I did opt to have it because I just wanted to know that I was keeping up with the schools with maths and literacy so I literally was happy to have them but you don't have to have them but she did say that at that age what I was already doing then was way more than she would get in school. Uh, when she got a bit older we moved up to using Reading Eggs which is a subscription service that teaches you how to read and spell. Very engaging, it's a series of games and you progress up through and you get eggs as prizes not real ones but you can exchange the eggs for virtual items in your house and so there's like a little rewards 
system is kind of like the equivalent of stickers I suppose. So she used to really enjoy that reading eggs. You can do a free trial I believe if you're interested in just giving that a go for a month for free. It was something she did independently without me once she got going and knew the form and I'd nip off and do some washing up in those 20 minutes. Thinking back I think we tended to do one literacy concept a week I think trying to remember but what I would do in the diary is I would you know write the main workbook to do on the first day and then one of the plan B ones the next day and then another one of the plan B ones the next day and sort of schedule it in to do one of each every day of that working week but if she did get the concept I kind of rewrite the plan you know and we'd move on to the next one and just take it from there sequentially really. Sometimes if she really wasn't getting a concept and I felt that it wasn't essential to get it before we could move on, we would just move on and I'd come back to it later. Because a lot of those curriculums, or curricula, they kind of cycle round year by year and revisit the same things but with a greater level of complexity. So if they weren't ready to take it in at six, they might at seven or eight or nine or ten or eleven. You know, you're still doing full stops and capital letters in high school. Obviously doing a lot more than that in high school but they still revisit it, is what I mean. Well, in our curriculums that we came across anyway. We personally always had a second language on the go. I did a whole video about that already, so I won't go into any depth about that, but I did used to schedule in 20 minutes a day. And I think that was four days a week because on our home ed group day, that was kind of our more or less day off, though we did do an hour of work on the train going to home ed group with little breaks in between. So we did do a bit on home ed group day in transit, but that was kind of like the bonus extra day. It wasn't a serious working day. Science! We haven't talked about science yet. Science we did get the Galore Park book. Galore Park do textbooks with exercises in, and a lot of home educators at that time were using Galore Park. I don't know if they still are. Private schools use them. We had a go. With science we did follow it in the earlier years, and I just worked progressively through those in every science slot that we did and that wasn't every day of the week I think it might have been twice or once I can't remember but you choose your curriculum you make it up you know do what you like so we would do a lot of practical activities in the house we might go to TechniQuest if there was a particular concept and I knew there was an exhibit there which demonstrated that so we'd go out and do it hands-on or go to the museum so for instance like when we were doing bones and learning about the differences between the different types of bones I happen to know in the museum in Cardiff there's a whole hands-on section for younger children when they where they had a drawer full of tibias of different species that you could get out and hold and touch feel and another drawer of a different type of bones and another drawer of a different type of bones but all different species I think that's I think I'm remembering that right, but there's loads of stuff out and about if you research it right, that you can use for your resources outside of your home without having to purchase them to have inside. Izzy was not keen on the textbooky approach to science. We did persevere for quite a few years. A lot of the exercises beyond the practical activities were sort of gap filling exercises. Copy this out and fill the gaps with the words from this box, that sort of thing. But you could have a look at the Galore Park website and see if you think that might be the sort of thing you like. Geography, again, we tried a textbook. I think we used one by Let's. We'd got it from a charity shop, but it looked pretty good, even though it was a little dated, so we used it anyway. But it didn't engage her, didn't stimulate her, and she was just bored. So I read through the curriculum, and I just sort of had it in my head what she needed to know. And as we went about our life, I would just draw her attention to little things that were in the curriculum while we were out and about. Geography, a lot of the times, like if we went somewhere, for instance, that had a visitor's map, like a zoo or something like that, I would give Izzy the map and have her be the navigator and follow along the path with the finger as we went. So she sort of learned map reading like that. If we went abroad on holiday, there's always a tourist map, isn't there? A big, chunky, colourful, blown up one that's easier to read than a normal one. And we watched a lot of programmes. I used to use a lot of BBC educational programmes and there is a YouTube channel, BBC Teach. I would definitely have used BBC Teach to supplement our learning because you can search videos by category. Now history, I think I did buy a Galore Park book for history but now Izzy loves history, it's her favourite thing other than drama but she did not enjoy it at all via a textbook. But history just took care of itself through day trips and very sort of intentional, meaningful experiences that I would engineer as I went along. We watched a lot of documentaries, 
she loves those programs where a family goes back in time you know their house becomes a 1920s house and they experience what life was like in the 20s and then it's a new decade every week those things oh she loved those she loved horrible histories can't big those up enough brilliant we got books out of the library we went to museums we went to St Fagans a lot in South Wales absolutely brilliant went to the castle lots of different castles in fact and like if we were on holiday we'd visit like the amphitheatres in Greece and things like that you know we'd always Wherever we were on holiday, we still we'd take the homeschool with us because a lot of the homeschooling was just living our life. It wasn't hard work or arduous, you know. It was just part of life, it was stimulating, fun, and fulfilling. So there was no need to stop falling into a bush. And every so often, I think, oh, I should be doing something a bit more textbooky or a bit more workbooky with these, you know. Am I missing some details out? And the minute I got them out, you know, her eyes would start shutting and she'd switch off. But if we went to a castle, she'd be totally stimulated and interested in taking it in. So I kind of instinctively felt that this might put us at odds with the rest of the population. But it was more meaningful and valuable and I thought more memorable and those experiences were more likely to endure than sitting and learning it out of a book. <laughs> Having a little stop to check the notes. <laughs> I haven't really been reading them. I've kind of written them all down sitting on my bed earlier. And now I'm just remembering what I wrote without checking. Oh yeah, resources. So I started really young teaching Izzy to read and write. I think when she was two we got Letterland books and I used to sing all the phonics. We used to look at the pages like Annie Apple, Bouncy Ben, Jumping Jack was it? Something like that. And anyway we made up a little song, well I made up a little song to go with all of the characters and we would sing them, it was like a little jingle. So we'd look at the characters in the book and we might be singing b -b 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 Bouncy Bear and things like that. <laughs> Sounds really silly, but that's what we did. And so she knew all her letters by the time she started school because she did go from age, what's it, three and a half till six. Different kids like different things and my little munchkin liked anything that she could relate to, something that was a character of some sort. So Letterland suited Izzy a lot and that was phonics, that's what we started with. I actually haven't run out of footpath, but I don't want to go too far from Izzy, so I'm going to dawdle back and keep on talking. So we did use Letterland, but I think that's before we homeschooled, to be honest. I think I was homeschooling while she was at school, but she did miss a lot of school, to be fair, because of her eczema. She was home a lot and in hospital a lot, so we used to do stuff while she was in hospital, incarcerated on IV antibiotics and stuff. Not in like a really forceful, full-on way, but you know, passing the time pleasantly in this manner. She was getting reading books in Welsh from her Welsh medium primary school while she was at school. And so she used to do those before she was home ed as well, which I would do with her in the evenings, as you're supposed to do when your kids go to school. Um, but those kind of stopped initially when she came out of school because I wasn't really qualified to be able to do it with her. But after all the phonics malarkey, we did a lot of Peter and Jane, the keyword series. They're really old fashioned books, the Peter and Jane. They're really old fashioned, but they're pleasant, simple tales that children can relate to, beautifully illustrated. And the words are introduced in order of how common they are in the English language, because like a huge percentage of the English language is made up of only a few words, relatively few words that come up over and over and over. So the idea is if you learn the keywords then you're going to be pretty literate pretty quick you know it's like a fast tracking thing but it's not phonics based that one I mean we carried on with phonics jolly phonics that's another one yeah we used jolly phonics I'd forgotten about that one jolly phonics is a bit like um, letterland really same thing but different characters we used a lot of jolly phonics workbooks in the early years I did also use a lot of Andrew Brody books for spelling in retrospect I don't know if that suited my particular child because she just always struggled with spelling and reading phonetically, no matter how much input she had from anywhere. <laughs> it's very, uh, yeah, just really overwhelmed by it very easily. So I think for us, we shouldn't have done the Andrew Brody, but I persevered for years with Andrew Brody, just learning spelling words by rote, but they just, they only went in long enough to, you know, pass the spelling test at the end of the week and then she'd forget them again. So I really don't know there was any point in doing those other than just practicing handwriting because a lot of it was um, the look cover spell method 
possibly the only benefit is I can say I tried. I'm going slightly random order again now because I'm not looking at my notes, but Horrible Geography. There's a book called Horrible Geography. Well, there are lots of books called Horrible Geography and they're on different topics, but we got a lovely colour illustrated Horrible Geography of the World and it is brilliant. I recommend that to any home educator out there. The Horrible Geography paper bags are just a great way to spend time on trains and waiting rooms and train stations waiting around. They're great for filling in those little 10 minutes of hanging around. Really good. Put them in your bag when you go on holiday. <laughs> she liked them so much she would have them as bedtime stories. My battery's nearly going. I can see. Doesn't matter though. I've got two spares in the case. We're all right. <laughs> Not getting rid of me that easily. PE. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about in this bit of the question. I've got two more questions after that. What I did personally was always had her signed up to at least one or two fitness related classes per week. She's been through swimming, gymnastics, loads of dance classes, tennis lessons in the summer once a week. She's done diving. Oh, in the holidays, in the holidays they always have like a week course learn to swim, don't they? So she was always in those. They were free in our area. She tried football, but she didn't like it, but she gave it a go. Loads of different dance classes, as I say, and a lot of drama classes, which weren't technically PE, but they did do a lot of very physical, get out of breath sort of games, especially in the younger years. They weren't really filling in our PE slot, but they were sort of extra shoved in to keep a fit. So that was one thing I did for PE. Another thing that isn't strictly PE, but she did a lot of free play with friends in her younger years, all the other home educators during school hours, you see, and they'd meet in parks, woodlands, play centres, go ice skating, have meetups at each other's houses and they always got rambunctious and physical you know what kids are like end up running around climbing on things and it's all fitness you know they'd get hot and sweaty and uh, it's all good exercise they would scramble over things it was all good for their gross motor skill development and thirdly as non-drivers, we walk a lot compared to most people. We just walk to get from A to B, you know. Right, my battery's flashing, hang on. Battery's back. Right, walking to get from A to B. Now, I used to allow plenty of extra time for this, make sure we were never rushing, literally schedule in that we could be quite leisurely. Oops, I said I was gonna be falling over, didn't I? This is kind of topical, actually. So I was gonna talk about walking over rugged ground and things. So while I was making my notes earlier, I kind of coined the expression baby parkour. I just kind of let her do what she wanted, kind of, as long as she was being safe. So if she wanted to balance along a low wall, I would sort of facilitate that, maybe hold her hand if she wasn't steady or if, if it wasn't safe. If she wanted to climb over a log if we were in a situation like this, I would let her. If she wanted to jump over some small things that were jump overable, I'd let her. As long as she wasn't in anybody's way or being a nuisance, as long as it wasn't in a crowded train station or something. But you know, if we were out during school hours while everyone's at school and work and it wasn't bothering anybody, I'd certainly let her do that. And if you think about what kids do in early PE, a lot of it is about balancing and climbing and running and jumping and hopping. And I found really that if you just leave them to their natural devices, they do all that stuff except it's more varied and more meaningful with association of the context. I think that's about all I've got to say on the early years curriculum but now we've got two more just little quickie questions. So now I'm never sure if I'm supposed to pronounce this hurrah or hooray but anyway hurrah or hooray is a student now aren't you? I think you go to school, been watching the channel for a while and she says how should you time yourself in terms of lunch breaks and intervals being fitted into your schedule? I'm worried that I might not want to get as much work done as I would have done at school. Well, I would just say make yourself a timetable if you're worried that you're letting the days slip past and not achieving everything you want to. You've seen how I do it on the channel. I use Outlook for mine but you could just use a bit of paper or just draw yourself up a chart with Monday to Friday on, or you could put some in at the weekends and spread it out a bit. You're in control. 
if you're off school now, presumably, because of the pandemic. So it's up to you, but I tell you what, I would try not to use your phone if you can get away with it. Now I know the problem with this, it's easy to say don't use your phone when you're doing study, but the phone is so flipping useful for looking stuff up, accessing GCSE by its size, using apps for flashcards, it's such a good resource. And you need to have it on the internet, don't you, for a lot of those things as well, so it's really difficult. So if you're gonna use your phone, disable the notifications. <laughs> And it's the same for me and everybody who's got a phone. It's so distracting. Oh, it's the bane of my life. I love it and I hate it at the same time. I would say don't go on too long without having breaks because after a while you just don't take in as much if you try and just go on for hours on end without a break. So definitely structure breaks in. And also what you could perhaps do is structure it so that you do something that's like really brain boggling. And then after that, something that's slightly less brain boggling, followed by something that's not very brain boggling at all that you might be able to do while there's music on or something, you know, uh, so that you're kind of breaking up the really intense stuff. And hurrah or hooray, and anybody else, I've got some channels that I might recommend to you. These guys are study tubers, and oh, they're, they're getting a bit long in the tooth now. They're not 16 anymore, but they were at one point, and they, when they were years 10 and 11, they were doing a lot of GCSE-related study videos. So you could go to their channels and look back at the ones that they did then. I'm not sure what they're doing now. I take no responsibility. <laughs> but uh, their names are Eve Bennett. She's one. Put her up on the screen for you. Unjaded Jade, Ruby Granger, Ruby Granger's perfect. She's just like a, a China doll <laughs> in human form. I think everybody wishes they could be Ruby Granger. But yeah, they're really into their study and routine and scheduling and revision timetabling. And they have got a lot of strategies that they can share with you on their channel. So definitely. Go and watch a few of those because they'll like whip you up into a frenzy of excitement about studying. <laughs> Last question and it's a really really quick one. Okay I'm I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation. I apologize. Arat Ja Ujot, our stories, asks I am a teacher and I am teaching from home. Is that homeschooling? <laughs> well if you want that to be homeschooling that can be homeschooling. <laughs> I would say technically yes it is but you might confuse a few people if you use it without explaining the deeper meaning. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!